Hey, everybody, welcome back to Too Many Men. My name is Allison Lucan. And as always, I am joined with someone taking one of the most fun, most prolific looks at what's about to go down in the playoffs. Read her work at Bleacher Report constantly. It is Sarah Sivian. Sarah, I enjoyed your 2000 plus words this morning. They were excellent. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, it felt good. You know, when you're writing and it feels like it's hard and annoying and like a task you have to do. And then other days it's like you blink and you wrote a thousand words. I was having fun with this one, which is good. Really, really love when that happens. Just kind of being a little silly, but also just pointing out some of the most interesting things about the playoffs that are about to happen. It's why you're one of our very favorite voices in the hockey writing space, Sarah. It's the best that there is. We love it. And of course, we would not be too many men without someone who we hope is soon, finally, a member of some chapter of the Professional Hockey Writers Association because she finally was discovered, as she should have been, by people who hold the invites. Uh, and we hope to see her name in the official voting cadre soon. And that is the Athletics Shana Goldman. Shana, say hi. Hi. Yeah. Who knew? I'm very interested, you know, the most disinterested hockey writer in being part of clubs. If you can find the needle in the haystack, you're welcome to join. Anyway. Were they just like, um, we, why aren't you in this? No, uh, Prashant, uh, so I wasn't on the list. Oh. Like he was on the site and he tweeted something and texted me like, you're not in this. And oh. I was like, no. And whoever knows like, oh, you're not. I'm like, no, I just sit here and talk shit about all of you voting. Leave it to him. He always, right. always points out the underrated people, whether it's on the ice or off the ice. So there we go. Ooh, I love that. Yes, absolutely. And the shout out to the chapter presidents of the Hockey Writers Association who do the work to bring in new writers. That's how I got in. Aaron Portsline in Columbus, who's the chapter president in Columbus, was sure to extend an invite and bring me into the fold. And that's huge. That's so important um, is for chapter presidents to always look at the landscape around you and make sure that your chapter represents what's actually happening in the world of hockey analysis and reporting. But I digress. Anyway, <laughs> it is time for us to begin with Sarah Sivian's very favorite segment. Sarah, what time is it? Bit O News. Bit O News. Well, we just wanted to first uh, circle back on a topic that we really enjoyed talking about last episode, but uh, to put some actual numbers behind this, that is the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship game, which averaged 9.9 .9 million viewers. That is more than any Stanley Cup game since 1973. And we are not an official women's basketball podcast yet, um, but we talked <laughs> a lot about this last episode. Just, Sarah, how does this continue to reflect on representing with the women's game in all sports professionally and then the attention and the craving that people have for it it just takes away i'm sure they'll find more bad faith arguments because then uh then they're in the responses saying well it's only because of caitlin clark what it, we tune into stars that's the whole yes it wasn't only because of caitlin clark by the way it was because several players that had not had like there were just several stars to arise from this and i know angel reese i it's so refreshing to see someone speak her mind like that. She rejected Joe Biden's apology about, we, why can't we all win? Because no, this is sports. This is competitive and it's supposed to be fun. And Clark gave Angel props for that too. And it's a, such a game respects game thing. And I just thought that the 9.9 .9 million viewers is, yeah, that's more than a Stanley Cup game since the 70s. And I just, people can try to keep making up reasons why we shouldn't cover women's sports or we shouldn't watch women's sports or whatever. But it's just, I, I saw a tweet that was like the woke media is trying, forcing men's sports on us. And it's so true because just look at the facts. I don't know. Dana, it, on the flip side of this, this is in fact a big blow to the no one wants to watch women's sports cadre of the world. But how exciting is this? How positive is this to see that if you build it, they will come. People have been craving this and waiting for this and they want to consume it. Yeah, like not for nothing. This is one of the most popular tournaments out there. March Madness is something people plan their lives around. Like, so if you can have more of it, why not invest in it and give give the people what they want? 
more chaos, more tournaments, more drama, more elite athletes. So it makes all the sense in the world. But for everyone who wants to say, oh, well, nobody cares about women's sports, like just because you don't, it's a problem for you. It's not a problem for women's sports. And those people like always feel like they need to have their opinions heard, which is really funny because no one gives a shit what those kinds of people think. Um, but it's just, it's the it's the truth. Like anyone that's going to sit there saying no one wants to see women's sports is just completely closed-minded. And it sometimes it's not worth <laughs> giving those people an audience you know, and, and even like giving them any attention because it's not worth the time or effort. But in other instances, it, it is worth being like, you're fucking wrong. And here's the proof. It also shows why people have not been watching women's sports, right? Because there hasn't been a certain investment in production, quality, whatever. And there is now, and there's the storylines and there is the coverage and people actually wanted to watch it, but they want to watch entertaining things so everything comes together now for this and yeah. it's just so annoying to see the bad faith arguments but we but what you said one is so right about the it's so hard to find it and watch it like if we talk about women's worlds right that's happening right now it's starting literally an hour ago it's so difficult to watch it for no reason at all uh if you're in the u.s you can watch on nhl network you can't stream it you can't watch games besides u.s air canada really and one of the players in a poll said like the nhl network doesn't do us any favors because they don't have streaming like there's a reason why the viewership might be low you have to have a very specific cable plan to have nhl network you can't stream it anywhere it, it if it's not readily available for people people can't consume it if they don't know how to watch it sometimes they're not going to be searching for it they they don't even think it's an option because in years past it outright wasn't so it's so important for there to be options to be the versatility to adapt to how everybody else watches sports today with streaming and with cable options and just amplifying where it is where you can find it that shows the investment that shows the effort if you actually do all that have i shared with you guys my nhl network rant my newest one have I Let's told you this? So, I'm not sure. Okay. So again, talk about not just growing the women's games that are on there right now, but also the NHL games and the NHL coverage that is on there right now. So we remember this, write it down. We pay for the NHL network through Spectrum in Ohio. We pay for it. We pay extra for it. Let me make that clear again. We pay for the NHL network. In Seattle, we can use our Spectrum subscription and watch Spectrum through the Spectrum app. Now we cannot watch local TV to our Spectrum subscription, which totally makes sense to me. We cannot watch the NHL network through the Spectrum app, even though we are paying extra for it, unless we are in Ohio. Tell me how that makes sense. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> and it's it just like- paying it, extra. It's such a disservice to our sport and to all I want to do is watch Jackie Redmond. I think she's one of the best things going in the National Hockey League right now. And I have to watch her through her Instagram sometimes and through her Twitter highlights that she posts because like the NHL network is blocked out in my area too. And I have to choose between Nesson, whatever, all these things. And it's just like how it's just such a dilemma right now in this sport. And it's a disservice to all the wonderful people that are on NHL network and the tournaments you want to watch you can't just like flip them on you have to always do something so it's just right really a that's, hassle that's you know what gets me too sorry but like no, that's that's my frustration is like the whole thing is well if you pay for nhl network you get it no i'm literally paying yeah, for nhl network I don't. and i can't get it through yeah. anything and like mm -hmm. nfl network's not all that different but literally you can go on nfl.com and put in your cable information and stream nfl network if you go on to any service, right? You can go into a Roku app and go into the NFL app and you can put it in. If you pay for Red Zone, you can watch it on there as well. You can watch NFL Network. If you go through your cable app on certain devices too, like it'll be like, say you have the Verizon Files, you go through the Files app, put in your information, you can watch the NFL Network. Why is that not an option for NHL Network? You could do for MLB and NFL. They want you to watch it. They want right. you to watch their service. If you're not watching it on cable live or DVRing it, which who among us is doing that? You're not seeing it. If you pay for cable, it should be available on all different mediums at this point. Like it's 2023. And it just sucks because it's like, yes, ESPN and TNT now have the rights to NHL broadcasts, but they still aren't discussing hockey nearly as much as they discuss football, baseball, basketball, whatever. And I totally understand that because it's not the most popular sport, but at the same time, it's so hard to just get good hockey coverage around the clock. 
a hundred percent. And again, I have zero issue with any provider or any broadcast outlet saying you must pay to get our coverage. Zero issue with that. The point is some of us are paying for it and still can't get it. It's just, and it's not how it's not just original content. It's games. There's literally, so yeah. many <laughs> games being streamed on there, which is great and wonderful because <laughs> there's so many games being streamed on there, which is great and wonderful to have, but it would be nice if your out of market so it's not on your regional sports network that you also can watch it without it necessarily being on cable like it just doesn't make sense if you don't have cable and the wild and the avalanche are on nhl network you can't watch it and obviously they're going to pick good games to put on there because it's a national broadcast they want the attention no the rest of the you're out and if you want to watch a replay of it you have to wait 48 hours for it to go on espn plus it's a joy. It's a joy. Well, let's uh let's go to the actual games because we are continuing in our slate of Actually, 2006. Can I bring up one more thing? Go ahead. About yes. the NHL scheduling while we're picking our gripes because what do we talk about all the time is how the NHL schedule is. Someone actually was trying to tell me it's not a big deal that the NHL stacks their games because most people watch one team at a time. And while there are a handful of fans who watch one team and only care about their team, and that is perfectly okay if you're that like that person, right? No judgment here. To act like other people don't want to watch other games, I think is really short-sighted. And to act like it doesn't hurt the game that you on a Friday night have zero games to watch this week, or you legitimately can't watch what's going on in the league because it does overlap with your team. Therefore, you're not going to watch something else. Like, it's n- it's not helping a league that's behind the rest to do it this way. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many what percentage of fans only care about their own team. They're not going to care about other teams if the games are constantly overlapping theirs, right? No, 100%. And that's actually where I was going, Shayna. In the <laughs> that? 206 games that were on the air yesterday, uh, we record on Wednesday, so this is Tuesday. You may have missed it. Um, because there were a lot of other narratives that we're going to get into here in a second. But in the Biddo News category, congratulations to the Colorado Avalanche, who have in fact clinched a playoff spot. They will fight to get their second consecutive Stanley Cup officially. I don't know that there's much more to say about that unless either of you has a comment. We just want to make sure we we give a tip of the cap to our beloved Kale McCars. A Anyone tip of have- Peter Baas. Little cowboy hat. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, another bit of news that we wanted to share, and this was just a feel good story. Um, and that is a uh, greater Toronto area native Jet Greaves, who literally is named after Jet Lee. Um, I don't know if you have been following the 8,006 players who have suited up for the Columbus Blue Jackets this year, but Jet Greaves got his first NHL start in that in Toronto last night. Um, a very special moment for him. He had tons of family and friends there. Uh, the Blue Jackets do lose the game 4-2. One of those goals against was an empty net, but kudos to Jet Greaves, who had 46 saves. It is the most ever by a Blue Jackets goaltender in his NHL debut He is just the ninth goaltender to make 45-plus saves in his NHL debut since 1955-56 when the league began tracking saves. That tidbit thanks to Aaron Portsline. And I just wanted to point this out because, A, that's quite an accomplishment against a team like Toronto. And also, when you have a lost season, I do think it's cool when you see organizations try and make sure to provide some feel-good stories and acknowledge some of the neater players in their organization. I don't know if any other stories like that come to mind for you, if you have a comment on Jet Greaves doing what he did, Sarah. Jet is grieving the end of wow. the CPJ wow. season. Just kidding. I, Yeah, that's fantastic. And it does, when the silver lining of these teams being bad is that you get a glimpse of their future and you get to get let the guys enter the league in a no pressure, low pressure situation. And sometimes that is the best way to enter the NHL. 100%. Um, All right, let's move on, my friends. Um, And we're going to shake things up a little bit this week. We usually come to you with our shit list, but uh, we have talked about this. We're sick and tired of talking about teams not honoring pride or not celebrating in pride. And so we are going to turn things around as we do from time to time and go to the anti-shit list. 
Uh, there are some really cool things. We've talked about a couple, but we want to highlight the cool things that teams are doing to make our game more inclusive. It's something we challenge everyone to do all the time. We figured we'd take a little bit of our own medicine. Um, and that is first, uh, two key instances stand out to us in the past couple of days. And the first is that the Leafs, how does this affect the Leafs, uh, <laughs> did release a video very cool of Megan Duggan well-decorated national player speaking to the Maple Leafs organization and highlighting the differences and struggles in equality um, to people who have not been represented fully in the hockey space before. And this was really powerful. And Megan Duggan is a rock star and it really struck me. You can hear the emotion in her voice as she is highlighting her experience of having to fight for the legitimacy of her marriage and fight for the legitimacy of her parent-child relationship to her children. And Sarah, just what stuck out to you? Yeah, she is a boss. She is currently the head of player development for the Devils. And it just elucidated how important it is to have women in these leadership positions for the NHL, not just as a random speaker. Like she is in in NHL leadership position and climbing up really quickly. If you see some reports from Emily Kaplan, they just love what Duggan is doing. And she actually went to Cushing Academy with my brother and my brother, not that he's the authority on anything, but he's always said she's just such a boss and she was destined for something in a leadership position. So really happy to see her succeed. But I just loved the emotion she put into it, the raw emotion of seeing somebody that is in this position, kind of break down and cry and show these guys that it's not just about a jersey. It's not just about the decal or what you believe in. It's about this woman fighting to legitimize her being able to be her kid's mom. Like, I, I just thought it did speak to them. I liked what Matthew said, that it humanized the whole thing and was pretty important. And I'm glad the Leafs shared that with us. Hundred percent. I, you know, it's it, this is what frustrates me about some of these conversations and how they just become all no, we're not going to do it. This is stupid. Like, listen, y'all. Like, there are tons of things every person on this planet does not know, and if you haven't had a life experience, I totally understand that it can be hard for you to understand that life experience. You may not understand that some people just don't outright always have rights to be with their children in a hospital to care for them, to sign papers, to authorize them to do things, to say that they are in fact legally their parent. That might not be something you've ever experienced because of your life path. But we have to be open to saying, let's welcome people that don't look like us, live like us, do things differently than us, because that makes us all better. And let's learn and understand what it feels like to be them, because I can't necessarily always understand what it feels like to be them. And they deserve my empathy and my compassion is just a fellow human being. Shana, what stood out to you about Megan Duggan's comments? Yeah, there's like a level of relatability. I guess not actually, because she's a champion and the Maple Leafs aren't. So I'm going to take that back. But um, <laughs> hey but here's a professional hockey player, right? Or, and someone who now works in the NHL, speaking to them like on a level to kind of like even the playing field in that sense and be like, look. It's not, this is not some random person they brought in, someone that doesn't have anything to do with their lives, doesn't understand their lifestyle. Like, here's someone who does. So I think that might have helped, but it just, it was so powerful, everything that she said. And it seems like the players, I mean, from what we could tell from the video, you know, like, seemed to, like, absorb what she was saying. But overall, it was just, I really like the line of thinking from our favorite team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, in how they put this all together. It feels like they wanted to approach things differently. And, you know, like this is a team that they've never done pride warm up jerseys. Right. And there's ways to have a powerful pride night without that. We saw that with the Avalanche. And I think the Maple Leafs really accomplished that because it wasn't just here's a couple like logos, stickers, whatever it was like. Here's something we're doing with our players actively. Here's also the T-shirts you see all the players wearing walking around here is they had drag queens. there, like putting on a I don't I don't know, some sort of like. They did something in front of a crowd outside the game. I'm, I'm not he positive. did something what... in front of a crowd. I don't know. Very I saw the pictures. The drag queens in... were drag queening for sure. The drag queens had a performance. Let's go it was like that. a performance. Yes. Was it, it was like... inclusive. 
It was, yeah, yes. exactly. We don't it know was, what happened, Shana, because there were 6,000 games yesterday. That's why I know. I know. I know. And, and I was like following along on Twitter. And I'm like, when you see it, like the quick hit, you're like, this is cool. But like all the little quick hits, it just felt like very thorough, very well thought out, very inclusive and unique. You know, it yeah. was different from other Pride Nights. And it just feels like that behind the scenes look of what they did to kind of educate the players. We talk about how these players need to be educated on so many things, right? Financially, they need help, you know, figuring out everything. They need some sort of guidance. I feel like so many NHL players have such sheltered lives, especially the players who are like thrown into hockey as kids and that's their path. So it just felt like they covered their bases in a really well thought out way. And I'm curious to see if this is the starting point for the Leafs and they just keep building up from here and if other teams can start taking note. And Joseph Wall, the goalie who's now up here because Matt Murray is injured, it has been open about how his faith is the center of his life. And he has a Jesus um, cross on his helmet. And he... A Jesus wore, cross. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a like, cross. <laughs> I'm no Christianity expert over here, but he has, he has a cross on his helmet. And next to it, he put the decal, the pride decal. So it just oh, shows... Oh, I've been saying... That's yeah. what I've been saying. Well, let's exactly. and let's let's look about this too. And this is one other point I wanted to make on this before we move on to our actual hockey talk. And you know, we talk about being inclusive and hearing the perspective that Megan Duggan brings when she makes her comments. But I think part of the reason this is important to so many people, again, above and beyond just wearing a jersey, is that maybe you don't understand that when you don't welcome others, it may not be your teammate or your colleague or your friend who you're speaking to because maybe that is not who they are. But it could be because it's someone who they love is that person. And I really appreciated this was reported by Emma Lingen out of Nashville. Uh, defenseman Tyson Berry, this is his quote. I think it's an awesome initiative. And this is about the pride jerseys. It's something that's really close to my heart. I've got family members and best friends in the community. And there's a little bit of frustration on my end with what's transpired this year with everything. I think I know how hard it can be for people to come out and live their authentic lives. And I hope that none of the stuff that's gone on has pushed anybody, anybody back, any young kids who are thinking about it. So I'm just really, really excited that everybody on our team is going to participate. And so again, I think these two stories are showing us why this matters, because you might be judging someone directly with you, but you also might be hurting someone directly with you because of someone they love or someone they know in their family. What stuck out to you about Barry's? I've always liked Tyson Barry, Sarah. What do you, what do you, how did his comments resonate with you? I thought, and somebody amazing on Twitter, Show Pony, who is a big Nashville fan, and I've always been a fan of theirs on Twitter, pointed out that this is probably the biggest pushback we're going to get from any NHL player. And it's so rare you see NHL players pushing back against other NHL players about anything that doesn't have to do with on the ice banter or whatever. So it was just really powerful to hear him say he was frustrated with the way others have been handling it. I thought that really made a statement that others have not made. And that's just being an ally, right? Because no, he's not gay. As far as I know, he does acknowledge that he has close friends and family members that are in the community, but he also is talking about a kid waking up and seeing that they're welcome and how important that is and him sticking it to people that are saying that they aren't welcome. So I just thought that was really important. A hundred percent. Well, let's move on to our very, very, very favorite segment. Sheena, I might have you announce this one because you're, you're just pushing it so hard. It's time for how does this affect the Leafs? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yes, my friends, how does this affect the Leafs? And I don't mean to make light of this. Um, this is a story we first started talking about last episode, but it is something to watch. Sarah mentioned it as well. Reports out of Toronto um, from Sheldon Keefe, Mer uh, Matt Murray, goaltender who left the game uh, we knew and was in protocol at the time, is reportedly day to day. But Keith brought up that he is suffering, quote, other issues to Shana. What can you share with us about what's being reported about this story? Yeah, it's just concerning because as someone who has a history of head and neck injuries, and it just feels like as much as anyone can make a joke because it's Maple Leafs and point to the fact that we knew he had an injury history and they still took the risk, like, it's still someone's life and... 
you know, their quality of life is super important, right? As much as it, it's unfortunate for the team that he can't play, like there's other things going on, it seems, and there's other injury concerns, like that happens. It's a collision. It's, it could have happened to anybody. Um, so I think it's just a tough situation that they're going to have to figure out their way through right now. Like, um, they have another goaltender that helps, but they just need Matt Murray to focus on his health at the end of the day, because it it does feel like his career has been affected by injury so many times that you have to like, make sure that you're not doing any damage. Right. Like, I know it's so easy for anyone to be like, oh, he should just come back into play or, you know, just let him back up and it's fine if he doesn't have to play or anything like that. But yeah, I don't know. It just has to be so important that he gets back to 100% health. Sarah, obviously the player's health is forefront, but this is a Leafs team that always seems to have something happen that becomes the narrative if they don't find postseason success. If we allow that we still really are first and foremost focused on the human on the ice, how much of a concern is this for a Leafs team that is about to enter back into the pressure cooker that is the postseason against a first round matchup against Tampa Bay? Well, I was thinking about it and it's just kind of like shit happens, right? The Hurricanes are without Freddie Anderson last playoffs and they still made it pretty far. They made it past the first round at least. You just can't make excuses. And as we are talking right now, Ryan O'Reilly is getting back in the lineup Wednesday night. A breaking night, bit so, of news yeah, that affects breaking, the Leafs. We're putting two segments together. Yes, here we go. So they got that back and... That's going to be huge for them. And I think Wool, I mean, he doesn't have much NHL experience. I think that was his ninth game, but he has a pretty good resume for just coming in. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So you can just go on a run like Kochekov with the Canes. I mean, that can run out really easily, but at the same time, maybe he's going to have a good run here and they just go with it. But Samsonov hasn't been that bad. And this team is too good to let any like they don't need absolutely excellent goaltending but they do need to get their heads on straight and protect whoever they have in net and it's as simple as that just come on just i don't need an excuse from them anymore they had got eight defensemen at the deadline literally they read their entire blue line so you could look at it too of them saying like we know our goaltending's not perfect this is how we're going to account for it because we've seen based on other teams you can go into the playoffs without elite goaltending and I like I hate that I always use this example too because like Darcy Kemper was elite all regular season but in the playoffs after he got injured he was below average and the avalanche were so good up and down their lineup that it was fine so if you prepare properly elsewhere like you should be okay and that's why like Ryan O'Reilly is so important well we wish Matt Murray a return to full health we appreciate the contributions on two fronts to how does this affect the Leafs? Let's stick in the East, my friends, as we move on to our actual hockey talk, although we've been talking hockey for a while here now. Um, again, I just going to keep upping the total in the 3000 games that occurred yesterday. This is when it's so frustrating because so many games are meaningful and there's too much happening. Um, better and- to have no games tomorrow on Friday, better to have two games on Sunday that don't even matter. In yesterday's games, two big things happening. First, let's talk about the Florida Panthers. Um, We spent a lot of time talking about the wild card race in the East. The Panthers come out with a 2-1 win in Buffalo, and they now sit in a wild card spot after Pittsburgh barely dials it in in a 5-1 loss to the New Jersey Devils, both the Panthers and the Penguins have played 78 games. The Penguins are one standings point behind and the Penguins of the two teams are the one that have the negative goal differential at minus five, while the Florida Panthers are at plus 13. Numerous times, y'all, we have said we were leaving the Panthers for dead, but they seem to be surging at the right time. Sarah, what did you think of the Florida-Pittsburgh combination of efforts and the results in the standings today? Do the Pittsburgh Penguins want to be in the playoffs? I don't understand how that happens. And granted, I didn't watch that game because there are so many games on. Did anybody watch that game who can weigh in on what happened? I watched that game, but I was more dialed into Florida-Buffalo. But I did have it on. You could just see Pittsburgh's defense 
It's issues they've had all season on an individual level. And then I think systematically too, the execution from some of their defenders is just so bad. And it kind of shows why, like, I know some of their deadline additions have been injured, but why they should have gone. First of all, they were willing to deal some of their better defensemen. So you have an issue right there, but why they should have gone elsewhere for like what they actually needed. It just feels like this team's forward depth at the bottom of their lineup is not strong defensively. They got rid of Teddy Bluger, who's like their best defensive forward. And then their defensemen are not that good. And the goaltending is not great either. So it just shows like this team, if they're going to make the playoffs, I can't see them blessing more than five games. Yeah, that's the thing. If they even get in, it's just, I, I think the Panthers are gaining traction at the right time. And maybe they needed the pressure off from winning the president's trophy. Now it's like, okay, you really didn't win the president's trophy, but now you got nothing to lose. Exactly. And this is what, this is again, where too many games I think hurts because if there's all these other games and one game goes, you know, into what looks like a no win situation, you just switch the channel versus saying, this is the hockey that's on tonight. We'll keep it on. We'll take it in whatever it is. I don't know. Um, The East is going to be interesting. The other piece of fallout from that uh, Florida win is that it does look like the Sabres might officially be getting themselves out of the hunt um, since they were on the losing end of that. Um, And they might be in the beginnings of a little bit of a goaltending discussion. We're going to see what's going on. Too much talent, too many players, um, but we'll see how that starts to shake out. Can we talk, sorry, can we just, for goaltending last night, Levi saved, I think it was 2.4 goals above expected. That's two positive games for him so far. Go Huskies, go Northeastern. (laughs) Let's get it. But if you look at the other side, Alex Lyon was in net again, and Natural Statric has him saving 4.3 goals above expected. So it was like a legitimately a like defense him. optional game. Yeah, gr- great for him. Like, could he be making, if the Panthers make it and he keeps playing at this level, do we do we have a little situation here? Because he's, he's competing when they need him to. I hope we do. He was a hurricanes prospect and had to get called up on emergency one day. And he came into the press conference with like his shoes off. And it was just like this, he was like a met Devin Levi likes to meditate too. So does Alex. So I guess they were like prime, both prime for this game. They're getting their heads in the game. Interesting stuff. I mean, you just happen to have a $10 million a year goaltender sitting there alongside him, but yeah, yeah that's it? painful, but it's a sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> and and it's class cost. people. And like, if, Sarah, from wrong, sunk cost fallacy. Let's go. I know some things. Wasn't Levi drafted by Florida the same year that they drafted Knight, and then a month later they signed Bobrovsky, which makes the whole situation even funnier because right now the Panthers could have a young tandem of Levi and Knight, and while they probably would have traded one anyway because when you have a surplus at a certain position, it's too fucking funny to me that Bob's the one not doing things and. Mm-hmm. Everyone else well, in, in his defense, he has been ill as of late. I know, this but like not... the season as a whole, Florida career as a whole, even last year when we were saying he's not the problem. It's he's too much money. Average. That's the thing. Yeah. It's just too much money. That's TMM, that. too much money, too little saves. <laughs> All right, let's move over to the West. And y'all, I think the house has burned down into ashes in a must win game. There she is. Barely, 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 barely. In a must-win game, in my estimation, the Calgary Flames going with Jacob Markstrom lose to, wait for it, the Chicago Blackhawks 4-3. That is decimating to their hopes to staying even in the playoff discussion. They have a must-win game. This is, again, Wednesday tonight going against the Winnipeg Jets, who are also fighting for their playoff lives uh, just incredible, incredible stuff. The narratives are so many for the picking. We know Jacob Markstrom has had a tough season, but he's been so important to them in the past. But the announcement made to start with him and and to go with your number one goaltender or whatever the exact words Daryl Sutter said, you go with the guy that you trust. Um, but the loss comes. That's obviously not just on the goaltender, but more so a statement on the team when you know it's a must win situation against, again, let me underline it, the Chicago Blackhawks, what is going on in Calgary? It does seem like they are now officially done. It's going to be almost impossible for them to stay in the postseason conversation. Is it too early to talk about what we think might need to change for this group going into next year? Or is this just a situation where things didn't come together quickly enough, even after they had a fast start? 
and they need to see what happens next year, Shayna. So it feels like the the flame has burnt out and as much as Mark might have tried to relight it, it's just there's nothing left on this wick, apparently. It's way too low. I don't know. I, I need I need a, a little thesaurus or a dictionary or something for this next time. Um, okay, first of all, the decision on Markstrom, too, I think is interesting. Most would tell you on the first half of back-to-back, you go with your starter because you give your team the best chance to win. And against a team like the Chicago, an easy win. I understand the decision. I also think it's like a do-or-die situation. And if you want to ramp up for the playoffs, you go with your starter. He's had a balanced workload this season. We know he can play a shit ton of games. You look at last year. I think he played like 80% of the start. So it's not to me that outlandish, even though the Winnipeg game is more important. I don't know. I, I don't have a problem with that. It was the start of the third period. That was just a disaster for them. But it's not too early to start talking about what to do with the Flames, because I think it's a year long conversation to have considering what happened this year. There's a conversation of, is there too much turnover in one off season for a team? And this is the result of it. There's a conversation of um, did they not get enough game-breaking talent? Because the game-breaking talent that they sign, like I'm a fan of Kadri. He's your 2C. He's not, you know, he's not that elite 1C, especially the age of the contract, everything else. Huberto, we know, is a supporting star. He's not your game-breaker. He needs the help. They have great defense. And then you go, why are you not moving where you have a surplus? to address other areas. It felt like all year they could have traded a defenseman for a high end forward and a team like Ottawa would have been like an ideal trade partner. But the biggest thing of all, and we keep talking about it is at a certain point, you have to ask leadership is the right. If the roster's in place and you invested so much in it, why are you just like letting things be? If the coaching seems like the problem, I think I get it, his reputation, but I don't know how that's not being talked about every day. Sarah, what are I just, the Calgary Flames? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Markstrom had a rough season and that really threw things out of whack. And I think so many changes can be really hard to get on track immediately. And then they really didn't. And that with the goals ending was just really tough. It's kind of crazy to see that they're basically extinguished. And the menorah, <laughs> it's been... Hanukkah for eight days and the menorah is running out. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think it's really something that's fixable. I think Markstrom just has to be better and everybody has to get together. Well, to Shana's point about goaltending, I mean, goaltending, coaching, it's like maybe that's the problem, right? That he didn't get them together. Well, and I think too, I mean, we talked about this when it happened and I am now just as guilty as he in that I am forgetting the uh, player who made his NHL debut. Shana LTA. knows it. Thank you. Um, but to be a head coach and to not acknowledge an NHL debut in the way that he did, um, y- you know, again, we have not been in pro hockey locker rooms directly, but I do have a degree in leadership studies. And that strikes me as something that would drop your follower confidence by a lot. Um, and you know, that those are hard things to overcome. And I think we talk about this all the time, but it's real. This time of year, if you are dealing with any kind of adversity or any type of chasing a goal that is is a hard goal to reach, you need to be motivated and you need to be cohesive as one, be that motivated for a good thing or motivated out of spite. And it just feels like some of those intangibles. Um, are at issue right now. I don't know. I mean, I think you could wait and see X's and O's wise how this group coalesces together, but I think there might be some other stuff going on. It'll be interesting to see how they deal with it. Can I add to you like the X's and O's aspect of it too? If we like even set leadership aside, there's a good question to ask, I think about defensive minded coaches and how long that can work for a team. I think Barry Trotz is a prime example of that. He would go to a team that's so flawed defensively and bring his structure. But at a certain point, three, four years in, you see that that structure is too much and it weighs on the offense. And now you need to bring in the opposite. And that's like how the cycle goes around the league. Daryl Sutter is a defensive coach. The Flames, we know, have the structure. That's why we all said Huberto is going to be fine there. They have defensive structure. And then they also have talent on the blue line. The two things together really work, but it's the defensive structure up front helps too. You look at their offensive generation this year and they're creating shot volume, ton of shots every game. They're not getting quality chances. Is the defensive structure holding them back? 
it's a question we would be asking for any other team at this point, like the Islanders last year, is the defensive structure too much? So even if you want to say it's not the leadership, it's not that he's wearing on the room, it's none of that, even though there's friend of the pod, Thomas Strands, put that chart up of when he insulted Peltier and when their <laughs> chances went down. Amazing. Even if you want to talk strategically only, like what's going on on the ice, there's a good conversation to have if they need an offensive coach now to blend the two. And then we'll see that cycle progress in a couple of years where you need more defense again. 100%. It's going to be very interesting. And, you know, I'm of the opinion that the defensive minded game is, is leaving as we move into yeah. a more my ultimate dream position was hockey, but that's a topic for another day. All right, let's 20 kill on- cars on the ice. Let's go. <laughs> let's talk about for our last story, a big, good piece of news that is seemingly coming out of the West. And that is that in year two of existence, it does seem that before we come back to you with our next episode, there's a very good chance knocking on wood that the Seattle Kraken will have totally clinched the first playoff berth in franchise history in just year two. It's a very exciting time in Seattle, and it's a very exciting time to see how Seattle is doing it right now. Their power play seems to be coming together. Their penalty kill has found its footing. Uh, They put up eight goals against Arizona, five against Vancouver, one of those being an empty net. Um, But just a feel-good story for a team that is fighting their way into relevancy after a really tough start, even as they await the return of injured Andre Burakoski. Sarah, you mentioned the Kraken in your article that you wrote and came out today. Just from a vibes perspective, how much fun is it to see the Seattle Kraken doing what they're doing? Well, okay, let me rib you in the ribs a little bit for a second. A feel-good story of a team that struggled so much in year one, making the playoffs in year I'm sure Buffalo Sabres fans think listen. that's a feel-good story, but I, I actually really like it because it shows, listen, you're going to be left behind if you don't start a franchise the right way. And, and to be fair, you got to give the cracking credit because I, they had just had an expansion draft with the Golden Knights and they didn't really get the kind of ha- dumb... G- GMs from around the league. The, the GMs were ready, prote- not making the same mistakes that they had just made. So they made some decisions, uh, Francis and co made some decisions that might've not been that popular, might've been confusing, but you have to tip your hat to them now for staying the course. I mean, I don't know, like it is pretty shocking to me because it's a lot of, I don't, I don't want to say random guys altogether, but it is, that's just kind of how an expansion draft goes. But I think It also shows the power of what we were just talking about, how the league's transitioning to scoring where goals is a very high scoring team and it's a young, fast team. And I think the youth movement, it it just really jives well with the rest of the league in context of the league scoring more goals than ever. Shana, what has impressed you about the Kraken? And of course, as much as this is a cool story, they are still just two years old. There are future steps to be taken. What comes next after this season? Uh, so I like for the Kraken that they had very clear holes last year, right? They were elite defensively. If anything got through, goaltending was a problem. But above all else, they had no goal support. And they were like, we're going to fix that. And they did. They didn't go the star power route. They went, we're going to go for balance scoring. And it's a different approach. And I Are really you saying wanna... Oliver Bjorkstrand is not a star because I object? I am a big Oliver Bjorkstrand fan. We, You know <laughs> this. He was our favorite for fantasy for yes. how long? Like, yes. so... Uh, I like their approach and I want to see how it works in the playoffs. Like we talk about teams that are good case studies, right? Like we've talked about the devils. Will it work not being super physical and will it work that they're a rush based team in the postseason? Will they go the Panthers route or the avalanches? Right? Like there's good questions to ask. And I think with the Kraken, like we're getting that same kind of thing. How does it work when you have four scoring lines? Because is it a strong link game? Is it a weak link game? Like we know for the regular season and we know it to a point for the playoffs, but the Kraken, I think are kind of pushing the bounds of it because they legitimately have scores on every line. The other part of it is they've been really good at identifying like reclamation projects. I don't know if Vince Dunn is the perfect example of a reclamation project because I think everyone knew his potential, but he just didn't get the opportunity to reach it in St. Louis. But we look at him this year and he is one of the best defensemen in the league. This is a Norris caliber player who is doing a ton without a lot of power play production. You know, like his his scoring totals, I think he's leading defense with percentage of points coming at five on five. Um, and he's 
it, you know, there's a lot of Kraken players like that. We're seeing the importance of five on five play, but you go up front and you say, okay, we knew Jordan Eberle was good. We knew Yanni Gord was good, but look at someone like Sprong getting the opportunity and someone like uh, Tolvin and getting the opportunity. Like they're, they're getting chances and they're making the most of it. And it feels like the coaches are maximizing them to have this balanced approach. It's going to be fun to watch. And I think for Kraken fans, it's it's great to see the players get rewarded after working so hard. And I think that there's still work that can make this team even better. And I think that's okay. I think it's exciting to see them start to build. All right, my friends, let's finish this episode the way we always do. And that is with our favorite game. And that is Fuck, Mary Kill. This episode, we are going to look at some other round one matchups. We did this last episode. So let's look again to the West here and talk about some West Coast round one matchups that we might like to see. Sarah, I'm going to have you go first. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Here are your matchups. Dallas, Minnesota, Minnesota, Colorado, Colorado, Dallas. Go. Don't come for me, Stars fans. I just don't care about the Dallas Stars, but I do want them to give me a reason to, you know what? Jamie Ben stood up for he didn't go the down. LGBTQ. <laughs> he stood up and stayed up. Okay. Um, oh, Minnesota, Colorado would be a lot of fun. I'm marrying that, that little rivalry that they have. Mike Russo is going to get lit up somehow. Something's going to happen. They all hate Mike Russo, which is hilarious because he's just like, He's a nice guy. He's so objective. He's like a classic reporter and the best at it in the world. And there's just, it doesn't matter when you're in a playoff race. There's the other team is going to decide you're a fan of the team and hate you. Yep. That's what has always happened to me. 100%. And I am going to fuck. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to fuck Colorado, Dallas, and it's going to be starfish. And then I'm going to kill Dallas, Minnesota, because I still don't care. Like, I'm so, I know this is really harsh, but I'm just trying to be as honest as I can. We, that's what we're here for. Shayna, your turn. Sorry. Um. Okay. I am going to also kill Dallas, Minnesota. Um. Doesn't do it for me enough. I think it would be a good series. I like the Kaprizov Robertson conversation because I don't think Robertson got enough respect his rookie year to Kaprizov when he does so much for the team. And I I, I kind of like the way the two like everyone's like Ovechkin versus Crosby and things like that. Like you could have it. Um. But it doesn't do it for me enough. So kill that. Um. I will fuck. Minnesota, Colorado. I think that would be a total banger of a series. But again, it's the conversation we had yesterday. That is round two. That is not round one. I don't want that to be round one. And then I will marry Dallas, Colorado. I actually think it would be a good series. Like, I think the two put up good games. Jake Ottinger is, you know, such a star player. And I think it would be nice to see the star power of Dallas that we know kind of leads the way go up against Colorado. And like you said, the Jamie Benesance is kind of fun. So I, I don't know. I'm here for that as a round one matchup. It does feel like it sucks for either one if they lose. Again, these are all bad matchups for round one, but I'll marry that one. All right. Well, I'm going to kill all of them because I feel like this is Seattle Kraken erasure. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I am going to, uh, I actually, listen, I, when the Kraken played Dallas three times in like four days, I was like, I have not paid attention to this team at all. And I actually enjoy them. And I also think it's hilarious about how they've been a really good team this year and their fans and their coverage and their media is all like, we're in angst. Everything's breaking. Why does this suck? We're terrible. So um, I will marry Colorado Dallas just because I think that's fun. And don't come for me, Wild fans. I know you have really great parts to your story, but the way Minnesota plays is just... Am I the only one that likes the wild here? No, you I like the be. wild. We want oh. Mark Andre. How funny would it I be? I like Mark Andre Peng Fleury, but Penguins eliminated Mark Andre Fleury and his little prank still going. I just love Mike Russo and Joe Smith too. Like I don't mm -hmm. know if I read enough reporting True. anymore, but I always read those two. Hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, so I'm going to marry Colorado Dallas because that's the one I like the best. I will fuck. Mm, Dallas, Minnesota, and I will kill Minnesota, Colorado. 
All right, my friends, that is it for us this episode. Things are getting even more exciting. We hope to bring some outside experts to some future episodes to continue to share what we're seeing and thinking about the playoffs. Um, If you want to interact with us until we talk again via the pod, you can follow us on social at two underscore much underscore man at Twitter and on Instagram. Let us know what you want to talk about. Let us know what your fuck, Mary kill nomination is. Check out the links in our bios to buy our merch. We have all the things that you could want and more. We wish a very happy Passover to our listeners who celebrate. And until we talk again, we ask you to please do something, no matter how big or small, to help make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. We will talk to you soon. Love you. Bye.